distinguished guests, a warm welcome to everyone. It is a privilege for the Indian Council of World Affairs to host Secretary of Foreign Affairs, His Excellency Mr. Enrique Monalo, for the 42nd Sapro House Lecture. I warmly welcome Secretary Monalo, a distinguished diplomat. He has several Indian diplomats as his friends, uh, who know him through his various assignments, including in the missions of the Philippines to the UN in Geneva and New York, and also as the uh, ASEAN SOM leader of his country. I had the privilege of knowing him as a SOM leader as well as in New York. Uh, so it's a special privilege personally to welcome you to Sapro House. I also extend a warm welcome to Ambassador Teresa Tadazo, who earlier served as the Ambassador of, India, Ambassador of Philippines to India. She is well known here as a friend of India. India and Philippines formally established diplomatic relations in November 1949. Our countries have a shared history of shared values and common approaches on a range of issues from anti-colonialism to South-South cooperation, and both our countries have strong democratic polities. Friendly relations between the two countries have seen a resurgence in the recent years. For example, last year, Prime Minister Narendra Modi had a telephonic conversation with President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. and congratulated him on his election as the President of the Philippines. Earlier in 2020, External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar visited Manila, and that year itself, uh, former Secretary Lavinuska visited India. Your visit, Secretary Manalo, in the first year of your tenure is significant and marks the continuation of high-level interaction between our two countries. India's Act East policy and strengthened ASEAN-India relations have had a positive impact on bilateral relations. Philippines is a key partner for India's Act East policy and an important factor in the emerging strategic framework in the Indo-Pacific region. India and Philippines striding the two corners of the Indo-Pacific region have vital stakes in upholding a rule-based order to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. India understands that ASEAN has a critical role in issues of regional concern. India was among the first countries to support the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, AOIP, especially as it had commonalities with India's own Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, IPOI. Recent global developments have underlined the need for greater cooperation and collaboration to face challenges like supply chain disruptions in energy, food, fertilizers that have deeply impacted countries of the global south. At the same time, nations are understanding the value of working closely with others who share similar approaches and concerns. And countries are seeking partnerships that prioritize responsible behavior, trust, and reliability. Multilateral institutions, including the UN Security Council, need to reflect contemporary global realities to be effective and relevant. India, as the current G20 chair, is focusing on multilateral institutions for the 21st century, issues of concern to the global south, as well as green development, lifestyle for environment, SDGs, technology-enabled development, and women-led development. As we move into the future, there are many areas in which our two countries can work together in multilateral and regional groupings, and at the same time, expand bilateral relations in existing and newer areas, such as defense and maritime security, blue economy, development cooperation, fintech, digital economy, space, among others. We look forward the, uh, to hearing Excellency Enri Monalo, Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of the Philippines, uh, on his lecture titled Shared Values and Common Outlook, the Journey of India-Philippines uh, India -Philippines Cooperation. Thank you so much, and we look forward to your Thank you, Ambassador Singh. May I now invite Ambassador Teresita C. Daza, Director General FSI, DFA spokesperson, and former Philippine Ambassador to India and Nepal to give her remarks. Director General of ECO Ambassador Vijay Takur Singh, Honorable Secretary of Foreign, of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines, His Excellency Enrique Manalo, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. 
It is a great pleasure to be back in India, where I've formed many fond memories and very significant learnings as well. The rich culture and history of India, which harkens back to ancient times, is truly a marvel, one that must be experienced to be truly appreciated. But me, even more importantly, in my time as Philippine ambassador to India from 2015 to early 2019, I met many individuals both from the public and private spheres and saw firsthand that, sh that shared democratic values and principles between India and the Philippines that have shaped the contours of our bilateral relations, bringing to fore the facets that have defined its strength and longevity. It is worth noting that India and the Philippines will celebrate the 75th anniversary of our bilateral relations next year. The ASEAN region, and to a larger extent, the Indo-Pacific region, is rife with opportunities, its potentials limitless, but it's also beset with its own set of challenges. In his speech at the Shangri-La Dialogue in 2018, Prime Minister Narendra Modi spoke of the Indo-Pacific region and I quote, that our common prosperity and security require us to evolve through dialogue a common rules-based order for the region. And it must equally apply to all individually as well as to the global commons. Such an order that must, must believe in sovereignty and territorial integrity as well as the equality of all nations irrespective of size and strength. Asia of rivalry will hold us all back. Asia of cooperation will shape this century. Indeed, these words speak of commonality shared by India and the Philippines and the Indo-Pacific region, which as we speak are contending with several geopolitical challenges and flashpoints that run the gamut from the traditional, territorial, and non-traditional issues. Secretary Enrique Manalo in his speech the CSIS Southeast Asia program ahead of the Philippine-US 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue in April 2023 also alluded to this when he remarked that the interdependence of economies in the Indo-Pacific, which is actually a regional powerhouse now, leading post-pandemic global recovery, is salient to its dynamism. And it is the very same compelling rationale for states to keep to the path of cooperation despite disruptive dynamics of competition and strategic rivalry between the United States and China. In this vein, the need to explore and discuss the concerns shared by the region is even more critical. Upon looking at the vision of ICWA, I was struck by its first objective, to promote the study of Indian and international affairs so as to develop a body of informed opinion on international matters. Informed. In this age of disinformation and misinformation, it is crucial to possess the facts and ascertain what is real and what is not, particularly in the realm of foreign policy. The need to be vigilant is greater now more than ever when our digital domain is also engulfed in a tide of half-truth and confusing information. ECO and FSI signed a memorandum of understanding on 16 November 2017 that aims to deepen our institutional linkages and foster collaborative exchange and cooperation to promote better understanding and relations between the Philippines and India. To this end, FSI and EQUAS focus on research are vital platforms to explore and raise the nuances of issues on international affairs, to seek knowledge and establish facts, and in the process, hopefully contribute to a region that espouses shared values and principles and help implement foreign policies that promote peace and security. I thank ICWA for actively co collaborating with us in this maiden lecture. With this inaugural event co-organized by ICWA and FSI, I believe that we're headed in the right direction and it's my fervent hope that this collaboration will continue and strengthen as we face the future with confidence and optimism. Dhanabad, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Daza. 
Now I have the honor and privilege to invite His Excellency Enrique A. Manalo, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, the Republic of Philippines. He's a seasoned career diplomat. He took his oath of office in July 2022 as a new Secretary of Foreign Affairs. He has a long and distinguished career in the Philippine Foreign Service and vast experience in diplomacy. During his more than four decades of service in the DFA, Secretary Manalo was appointed as Undersecretary for Policy twice. He was the principal advisor to the Secretary of Foreign Affairs. As Undersecretary of uh, Foreign uh, Policy, the Secretary Manalo also served as Philippines senior official in the ASEAN senior officials meeting, which is a working level mechanism for ASEAN policy formulation and priority setting. He is an expert in multilateral diplomacy, having served as a Philippine permanent representative to the United Nations in New York, immediately prior to being appointed as Secretary of Foreign Affairs. He was also the Philippine permanent representative to the UN in Geneva. I now invite Secretary Manalo to deliver the 42nd Sapru House Lecture on Shared Values and Common Outlook, The Journey of Philippines-India Cooperation. Good morning, everyone. Ambassador B.J. Thakur Singh, Director General of the India Council of World Affairs. Ambassador Teresita Dasa, the Director General of the Foreign Service Institute of the Philippines. Uh, my colleagues, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is certainly an honor and great privilege to stand before you today to share my thoughts on the long-standing and excellent friendship and relationship enjoyed by the Philippines and India. I would also like to express my sincerest appreciation to the Indian Council of World Affairs for providing me with this opportunity to speak before you uh, today. I am in India, among others, for the fifth meeting of the Philippine-India Joint Commission on Bilateral Cooperation, or the JCBC, upon the invitation of Minister Jai Shankar. This meeting uh, will build on the positive trajectory and high-level interaction between our two countries, especially over the past five or six years. Moreover, it takes place in the months leading up to the 75th year of our diplomatic relations in 2024. It is also time for considering and pondering upon the milestones of our ties and also what lies ahead. Our relations and the future and their future stand on the rich centuries-old historical connection between our two peoples through maritime trade as well as social cultural exchanges. They also draw purpose from our affinities as democratic Asian republics. So in this lecture or speaking engagement, I will address the rich common ground uniting the Philippines and India in their conduct of diplomacy and also our approach to international affairs. Firstly, democracy and pluralism are defining features of our respective national identities. As such, they provide deep anchors to our ties. The thoughts of contemporaries Jose Rizal and Rabindranath Tagore, still a subject of contemporary scholarship, tell of the fires of national awakening in the forge of enlightenment ideals during a parallel colonial experience. The fight for freedom gave birth to a strong sense of national identity, leading to the establishment of Asia's first republic in the Philippines and the world's largest democracy in India. Today, Filipinos and India, Indians embrace the values of freedom, peace, and justice. Our democratic systems provide frameworks for protecting human rights, promoting inclusive governance, empowering our citizens. Democracy frames our endeavors to build resilient and thriving societies where diversity is celebrated as a source of strength and dynamism. Secondly, the Philippines pursues an independent foreign policy in accordance with our constitution. This is something we share with India. We promote our national interests and principles while seeking peaceful and mutually beneficial arrangements and engagements with the international community. President Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr. has enunciated this policy with the Philippines being friend to all and enemy to none. 
Intrinsic to this policy is the belief in the agency of states to pursue their own paths of progress and development and to have an influence in shaping their environments in solidarity and peace with other states. Thirdly, the Philippines and India are staunch advocates for inclusive multilateralism that responds to the challenge of our age. As founding members of the United Nations, during the era, era of decolonization and the Cold War, the Philippines and India have put themselves as champions of national independence, self-determination, and promotion of the interests of developing countries in the United Nations and its specialized agencies. To this day, we are working together to amplify the voice, the voice and perspectives of the developing world in all important global discourses through the Group of 77 and the Non-Aligned Movement. We both work actively to create a UN system that is fair and able to evolve and deliver for its constituents. Fourthly, for both the Philippines and India, peace, security, and stability are critical to enabling populations in our countries and elsewhere to enjoy the fruits of sustainable growth and prosperity in freedom and sovereign equality. And we have demonstrated our commitment to the cause of peace in a tangible and profound way by being among the top troop contributing countries to UN peacekeeping operations worldwide. Filipino and Indian UN peacekeepers served together in seven UN peacekeeping missions, including in Cambodia, Lebanon, Sudan, South Sudan, the Golan Heights, Haiti, and Cote d'Ivoire. Parallel to this is our decades of tireless work in partnerships between and among developing countries to build capacities and to empower institutions and communities in the developing world. Altogether, these endeavors in the UN and in multilateral institutions are a vital expression of our mutual desire for a more equitable and inclusive world order where every nation has an equal opportunity to thrive and to prosper. They are an extension of our faith in democracy and the power of multitudes. Ladies and gentlemen, when we uh, delve into the societal fabric of the Philippines and India, we find remarkable parallels, particularly in our diverse and multicultural societies where people from various backgrounds coexist and contribute to our cultural tapestry and vitality. We acknowledge that diversity is a wellspring of strength and that true resilience is built on respect for different perspectives. This national DNA translates to the common approach of the Philippines and Indian diplomacy to recognize that harnessing diversity is key to making multilateralism work. Both our countries have played roles that seek to bring about a climate of mutual respect and collaboration among a wide array of actors and centers of influence in keeping with the demands of a deeply interconnected world. These roles have enabled our efforts to define a multilateralism that can overcome differences, bridge polarities, and forge consensus for collective action. These inform the vision and strategic frameworks for our respective sub-regions within the broader Indo-Pacific. India has put forward the concept of SAGAR, security and growth for all in the region, or the Indian Ocean region, while the Philippines, along with nine other Southeast Asian countries, has championed ASEAN centrality. Although these frameworks may differ in geographic focus and scope, they share fundamental goals, namely fostering regional cooperation and multilateralism, ensuring security in the maritime domain, promoting physical, digital, and institutional connectivity, advocating for open regionalism, and preserving the rules-based order that has provided the international system with stability and predictability. ASEAN also places great importance to India's unwavering commitment to ASEAN centrality within the regional security architecture. India's Indo-Pacific strategy introduced in 2018, converges with the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, 
especially in their mutual goal of maintaining a free, open, and inclusive region, and in the emphasis on maritime and development cooperation and adherence to international law. The Philippines and India, nationally and in the context of ASEAN, bilateral partnerships and groupings are at the core of robust partnerships and institutions that will underpin peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, in this changing global landscape, which we have been witnessing shifting power dynamics and complex challenges, especially over recent years, both the Philippines and India recognize the need for an evolving multilateral system. We each take the view that existing institutions must adapt to effectively address contemporary issues such as climate change and environmental sustainability, inequality and social justice, global health, migration, and the rise of new and advanced technologies, among others. The Philippines appreciates India's advocacy for a reformed multilateral system that promotes inclusivity, transparency, and accountability. On this, the Philippines fully agrees. International institutions need to be reimagined to be more responsive to and more reflective of the realities of the 21st century. Through collaboration and constructive engagement, we help shape a more equitable and responsive global order. I have often said that as long as there is no credible alternative to the United Nations and its multilateral institutions, we must persevere in making these institutions work and work better. In the center of our efforts for an enhanced and more credible multilateral system is the refocusing on the interests and well-being of our people. In other words, to place them back at the heart of multilateralism's goals. This will apply the spirit of the UN Charter's preamble, which begins with the phrase, we the peoples. As such, it will lend a succinct meaning to the work of many groupings like BRICS, the G20, and ASEAN for people-centered peace and development. And here again, Philippine and Indian diplomacy meet. For each of us believes that empowering marginalized voices and more inclusive decision-making processes are a key to making the United Nations not only more effective, but also more accountable. A deeper sense of ownership by many states and stakeholders of the UN and global institutions will contribute to consolidating trust and, more importantly, confidence in the multilateral system. Ladies and gentlemen, the Philippines and India have demonstrated remarkable resilience in the face of many challenges. Both our nations have overcome and emerged stronger from socioeconomic obstacles and political upheavals since the time of their independence. The 21st century beckons us to chart a course for bilateral relation for our bilateral relationship that mirrors our highest ideals and our determination to secure the future for our nations and the next generations. While Philippine collaboration with India within regional and international platforms is an important agenda, my mission in New Delhi will also focus on advancing our bilateral cooperation. And today we are, withdraw we are redrawing focus on facets of our partnerships in health, security, food and energy, cyber and outer space cooperation, and maritime security. Let me just cite a few examples of this. First, the COVID-19 pandemic has put health security as paramount in the global agenda and in shoring up national resilience. Our partnership, therefore, must venture more into research and development, investments in new technologies, and exchange best practices in delivering life-saving medicines and services to those who need them most. I note that our bilateral health cooperation has also acquired new salience with the Philippines' push for the establishment of its own Virology and Vaccine Institute and Center for Disease Control. Under President Marcos Jr., 
the Philippines is determined to set up a premier research and development institute or institutes that will help the country prepare for future pandemics, bioterrorism, and the prevention of the reemergence of endemic diseases. Secondly, to meet the needs of our expanding populations in the face of climate change, food and energy security are now in front and center of our ties. Investments and innovation are key to driving productivity and sustainability in these sectors. Thirdly, the Philippines and India are like-minded nations, bear the responsibility of safeguarding the global commons for the benefit of present and future generations. We have a significant role to play in shaping the rules and norms governing cyberspace, outer space, and the maritime domain. The complexities and challenges in these fields are profound, and they demand urgent and thoughtful regional and global cooperation and action. In the realm of cybersecurity, we can collaborate to address common threats and ensure the protection of data and privacy, especially with the increasing application of fintech in our local economies. By jointly promoting robust cybersecurity measures, we can reinforce a secure and trusted digital environment that fosters innovation, supports economic growth, benefiting both small, medium, and big enterprises, and protect the well-being of our citizens. The establishment of the Philippine Space Agency in 2019 pronounced the aims of the Philippines to participate in space exploration and to optimize the use of space-based technologies for development. We hope for stronger collaboration with India towards this end, including in promoting equitable and democratic access to outer space as part of the global commons through norms that protect the interests of all and uphold the common good. Lastly, as, marine, as maritime nations situated at the crossroad of the world's busiest sea lanes, the Philippines and India share a vested interest in maritime security and the preservation of our invaluable marine resources. We must intensify bilateral initiatives for knowledge sharing and capacity building to uphold seafaring standards, promote adherence to maritime trading rules, and enforce marine environmental protection measures. This way, we're able to not only protect our oceans, but also to ensure the long-term resilience and prosperity of the communities reliant on these waters for their livelihoods. The Philippines and India, as vanguards of international law and multilateralism, recognize the importance of upholding and strengthening the rule of law in the global commons. Our pursuit of a predictable international order that respects state sovereignty, promotes stability and fairness, and provides for the peaceful resolution of disputes based on international law is a hallmark of the responsible global citizenship that characterizes Philippine and Indian diplomacy. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, as I conclude, let me state that the bilateral relations between the Philippines and India, which have flourished across various sectors over the years, are flexing for further growth in scale and in depth. While our nations navigate the current global landscape, our history of cooperation, rooted in shared values and common outlook, points the way for more meaningful cooperation ahead. Our engagement in the past decades in trade, defense, education, and culture has deepened our mutual understanding and solidarity. This provides the sound footing for our future ties as they gain new contours of common purpose in the 21st century. Democracy will always hold a deep resonance in the hearts of the Filipino and Indian people. Democracy embodies the triumph and primacy of the people's will. Enabling, enabling them to shape their own futures and participate in governing their respective nations. By the representation and empowerment of diverse groups, democracy nurtures a sense of belonging and ensures that the vo voices of all citizens are heard and valued. For these reasons, the Philippines and India profess an unwavering faith in democracy and its unique power to unite, inspire, and transform. 
Through the vicissitudes in global politics and in light of the unfinished quest by the community of nations for peace that endures and upholds the best of humanity, this is a most formidable bond between our two countries that serves our people and, our, and the good of our region and the world. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Excellency, for your insightful and enriching lecture. Now I request Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh, DG ICWA, to moderate the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you so much, Secretary Manalo, for your very comprehensive talk. You've covered several regional and global developments and demonstrated how India and Philippines actually approach them from very similar angles. And I'm sure that provides a bedrock for a very strong relationship between our two countries. Now we have time for questions. Uh, what I would do, uh, Excellency, is to take three questions, and a second set of three questions, and we see how the time goes. Uh, so please raise your hands, and I'll take questions from the floor. Uh, let me take uh, one from here, uh, Dr. Sanjeev from ICWA. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, His Excellency, for the comprehensive and enriching presentation on, uh, on the journey of Philippines-India cooperation. My question is regarding China's role in South China Sea. Uh, we all know that China talks about dialogue, but uh, it, uh, its action shows confrontation in South China Sea. So my question is, do you think a, code of conduct is essential in these circumstances for all parties, especially China. And the related question is, how do you see the progress so far on the code of conduct over South China Sea? Thank you, sir. Okay, second question. Uh, all right, I'll take one there. They should have a Thank you very much, uh, Excellency, for your very insightful presentation. I'm Ashok Sajanhar. I'm former ambassador of India to a few countries. Uh, my question is uh, related to the first two. And uh, maybe you know this threesome would really uh, come as uh, uh, possibly one response. And the question is that Philippines had uh, gone to the permanent court of arbitration in uh, possibly 2014 on the activities of China as far as uh, South China Sea is concerned and the islands in the vicinity of the Philippines. And we had got a, a, a response, a verdict from the Permanent Court of Arbitration in July 2016 uh, that was that vindicated the position, uh, uh, upheld the position of Philippines and totally rejected the position that had been advanced by China. My question is, uh, could you kindly share what is the particular status of that particular case that you had taken? How has the verdict been implemented? And uh, 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 the, the complaint that Philippines had, has it been uh, sorted out to your satisfaction? Thank you. Mr. Manal, you have to. This is Secretary Manal. This is done. Uh, yes, well, thank you very much for those uh, questions. I think they're, they're all uh, stated, uh, related. So uh, maybe I'll try and uh, answer them uh, individually, but I may have the danger of repeating myself. But uh, anyway, first, uh, on the China's role in the South China Sea and uh, dialogue mechanism. Well, first, let me say that, um, of course, there is a, a Chinese presence in the South China Sea, and especially when they did declare the 
the so-called nine dash line, which uh, uh, was not accepted, I believe, by, by the world community. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why the Philippines uh, filed for the arbitration case was to, to uh, get a, 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 a hearing and a decision on the legality of China's claim. And the award came out in our favor, but I'll get to that a bit later. So there is a chi China is present in the South China Sea, and they have, um, in various ways, through uh, the presence of their, uh, let's say, maritime uh, units, as well as through land reclamation, and most of these are occurring or are taking place in, uh, inside or in the EEZ of the Philippines. EEZ is defined by UNCLOS. So we have repeatedly stressed that to China that. Um, we feel that uh, their presence there is in violation of uh, the rule of law, simply because they are, they are there without our, um, without our acquiescence or even our approval, as defined by the rights, our sovereign rights, in the exclusive economic zone in the South China Sea. So we have repeatedly challenged that, and uh, we'll continue to do so as long as they are present there. But nevertheless, we have uh, also, uh, in our talks with China, agreed that uh, we will seek to resolve our differences in the South China Sea through, uh, through dialogue and to manage our disputes in, in that area. And we have, we have sought to faithfully um, uh, abide by that by uh, agreeing to uh, address these issues in a number of dialogue um, mechanisms which we have. We have a bi uh, bilateral consul consultation mechanism on the South China Sea. We have foreign ministry consultations with quite a number of mechanisms aimed at addressing this through dialogue. Uh, of course, um, as you might be aware, uh, this dialogue uh, is not necessarily one where you reach agreement after one dialogue, so these are continuing, and certainly uh, we are committed to do so, but <coughs> nevertheless, we have, uh, we have um, almost on a daily basis made our concerns clear to China. Uh, but at the same time, just let me stress that our, we have also agreed that the differences are, we have in the South China Sea with China are not the sum total of our relationship with China. We have a quite a, a vast or a, a, quite a significant bilateral relationship with China and other areas such as in the economic sphere, cultural, etc. But uh, nevertheless, um, this of course remains a major challenge in our relationship. That is the situation in the South China Sea. Now one of the other mechanisms which in this, and I have to stress all nations in Asia as well as China agree, <laughs> There is a need to see whether you can come up with a code of conduct on the South China Sea. And uh, negotiations, uh, in fact, have uh, been taking, have been going on for the past four or five years. And um, I think we still have some way to go in the negotiations for a number of reasons. But just let me say first is that this is a negotiation between not uh, necessarily ASEAN and China, but it includes all the ASEAN. But it's really a negotiation among 11 countries, the, the 10 ASEAN and China. So you can imagine the complexities of this uh, kind of negotiation with uh, basically 11 countries. Though ASEAN does have general agreement on the broad contours, it's when we get to the specifics that we have a lot of discussion. And these are also quite technical in nature uh, in the code of conduct. So what I can say is that on the political level, China and all the ASEAN countries are committed to, to pursue the negotiations on an effective and substantive code of conduct. Uh, of course, there are many, as I said, many issues involved here, so we have to resolve them. So uh, let's just say that um, uh, we may not be seeing the light, of the, the light at the end of the tunnel, but we see the tunnel, and that's where we are. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, now on the, uh, oh, on the recent uh, uh, pronouncement of the United States. Well, let me just uh, put this in proper context. The Philippines and the United States have our first treaty allies. We have a mutual defense treaty, and we also have additional arrangements such as the visiting forces arrangement. And what was announced by the U.S. is, certain, is just consistent, basically, with our treaty alliance. And, uh, of course, uh, Every time uh, there's an announcement made, especially nowadays with the U.S.-China competition, uh, one side always tends to see it within the prism of their, their rivalry. So, uh, for example, in this case, uh, China has, uh, may have commented not only on that, but on some other issues, uh, always looking at it uh, from the U.S.-China rivalry. And uh, what we have consistently stated is that 
these uh, activities or actions that we are taking are, are purely within the context of our mutual defense treaty and uh, in accordance with our bilateral and national interests and not uh, in the context of any U.S.-China competition. And we have sought to make that very clear. And uh, we are looking at these um, in the context of our, our legitimate interests and our, and our needs uh, in terms of our national uh, security and defense requirements and not aimed at any particular country. Uh, on then a question on the arbitral award. Uh, yes, the, um, uh, as I said, we successfully uh, won the, our case. And uh, that was in 2016. Unfortunately, China does not recognize the award. Uh, we and many countries in, in the world recognize the arbitral award as final and binding. And, uh, and basically, uh, a judgment on the, um, on the, uh, on the nine dash line, which China uh, was claiming. So um, we are, we believe the arbitral award stands and that countries uh, uh, would be bound by the arbitral award. So we are um, looking at it in that way and uh, I think many countries are espousing some of the uh, key provisions of the award, that is to allow for freedom of navigation within the South China Sea. And that is something which uh, uh, countries observe. So I think I would, uh, more or less say that the arbitral award is final and is binding, and we leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary Manalo. I've got so many hands up now. Uh, maybe I'll start here, Ambassador Guatemala. He raised his hands very early on. Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Director General Ambassador Bitti, for uh, convening us today. Also, it's a great pleasure to see his Excellency Enrique Manalo, Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of the Philippines. Well, we commend uh, his leadership. I, am, I was the Deputy Permanent Representative of Guatemala for several years in New York, and I remember very well his leadership, particularly defending also the human rights of the migrants. That's very important. And also, you were one of the pioneers with regard to the Global Compact for Migration. And I remember that during that time, I think it was four or five years ago, or a little bit less perhaps. <laughs> yes, uh, but with the Philippines uh, in the past also, uh, Guatemala and the Philippines, and also our Indian colleagues as well in the, in the UN in New York, we established the International Day for Family Remittances, which is an important day also commending the efforts of the migrants around the world. Now we see, for example, that migration continues to be a, one of the most important topics in the international agenda. But uh, my question right now would be, uh, how do you think we can put in the scope of the Security Council, particularly taking into account the changes on the climate change that is affecting the migration around the world, how the topic of migration could be included in the agenda of the Security Council, or eventually to uh, adjust this to the reality, to the contemporary reality of the world. Again, my congratulations, distinguished uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, and good to see you here, as well as all your team, and thank you for the invitation today. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, okay, I'll take uh, one there, one hand there, and one hand here. Hi, sir, I'm Sidhan from Vion. Uh, so my question is, you're buying Brahmo's missile from India. How do you see India as a country from where you can buy defense assets for your country? Okay, one question here. Imani, you take Imani back. Imani back. Uh, thank you, Excellency, uh, for a very nice lecture. Uh, I'm Captain KK from National Maritime Foundation. Uh, I had come across a media report uh, with regard to the India ASEAN uh, maritime exercises, where uh, it was reported that the Chinese maritime militia sought to uh, disrupt the excises somewhat uh, by trying to get into the same area of excises. And that the uh, Philippines uh, uh, Navy ships or maritime security agencies uh, tried to thwart it. My question is uh, uh, with regard to the veracity of the uh, media report. And uh, since you are the government, maybe uh, I would like to know your perspective uh, with regard to uh, reality or otherwise of it. Thank you. Secretary Manalo. Thank you very much. Uh, well, on the on the first uh, question from our colleague from uh, Guatemala, of course, uh, 
uh, it's so evident now that climate change is really at the top of the, the almost at the top, or if not the top of the agenda, is probably one of the uh, major, or if not the major, uh, global uh, security challenge. And I think uh, this uh, already implies that climate change has, has so many effects on so many uh, issues and, and sectors in our societies. And uh, it's certainly something that we have to um, really address. And I believe not only uh, in terms of uh, in the General Assembly, but also in, in institutions such as the um, Security Council, because they, it does pose a major uh, security threat in so many ways. And um, and I said, since it influences so many sectors, uh, this particularly includes the, its, the potential effects on migration and, and the dangers that, for example, uh, natural disasters or even rising sea levels pose to the um, to, to countries and, and the implications this has on, on migration. So uh, I think this is certainly an issue which has to be uh, explored in more depth, especially from the uh, global and uh, regional and even national security angles, which makes it also a, a good candidate for the, uh, for the Security Council, which, uh, by the way, the Philippines is running uh, for in uh, 28, 27, 28, so you might be hearing more about this from us, especially these issues, uh, because these are new threats which we have to really address uh, through global cooperation. I think the, the issue of migration is very important, not only because the Philippines, has a stake in this, but I think all countries uh, have a stake and, and the implications climate change would have on, on migration flows. Uh, on the point of, uh, yes, well, uh, we certainly hope to develop a very robust defense uh, cooperation arrangement, uh, arrangements with, with India. We already have uh, entered into some potential deals and I think we'll be looking forward to having more. In fact, uh, that's one area which I hope to discuss uh, also during my meetings tomorrow the Minister Jai Shankar and also our defense uh, officials have also been in contact regularly on this. So we certainly uh, view a, a partnership with India in the defense area as one of the uh, uh, brighter aspects of our future uh, relationship. Now, and I'm not talking about the long, the distant future, but in the near term. Uh, on the uh, ASEAN maritime exercise, I don't have the full uh, details of, the, of that uh, encounter, but I, I, all I can really say is that uh, ASEAN-India cooperation uh, in, this, in the maritime sphere is an important aspect of our collaboration, and the Philippines is also uh, very much behind ASEAN in that effort. Uh, uh, and also that we see great potential in Philippine-India uh, maritime cooperation and, and uh, increasing greater contacts in the maritime sphere, especially through uh, maritime domain awareness, greater collaboration with each other. And uh, again, another point that I might raise in my talks tomorrow too, that uh, we have a uh, wide, quite a, a wide range, a great scope for cooperation in this area. And I'm not only talking about military, but even in terms of uh, maritime domain awareness as a whole. The Secretary has agreed to take a few, uh, two more questions, so I'll take one from this side and one from this side. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. I'm Deepak Maheshwari from ICREA, the think tank. My question is uh, specifically with respect to the word cyber, you used at least four times in your uh, intervention. And uh, so in Philippines, we already have the Data Protection Commission, and I had a pleasure of interacting with the Data Protection Commission in Philippines. And in India, of course, we are still in the process of framing the data protection law. So one is uh, what type of cooperation opportunities that you see in this area, and specifically in terms of cybersecurity for fintechs, as you mentioned, uh, what are the specific issues that you want to sort of explore there? Thank you. Thank you. And one question from here. Thank you, Excellency, for a very comprehensive lecture. My question relates to the impact of the ongoing war in Ukraine, which is, uh, we all know has had global repercussions. So what is your assessment of the crisis on Southeast Asia and Indo-Pacific in the larger context? A follow-up question is, with respect to uh, your country dealing with supply chain disruptions in the wake of the war, given that both Russia and Ukraine have been major, have been major green suppliers to your country. Thank you. 
Okay, one secretary has agreed to take more. more. Okay, I see one hand go up there. Okay, here, Ambassador, Ambassador Goyal has a question. Uh, thank you very much, actually, Mr. Secretary Manalo. I was just wondering, basically, has ASEAN developed a common position on security architecture in Indo-Pacific? Uh, there have been several differences I see coming from different members. And you also mentioned the negotiations between China and ASEAN is actually 11 countries in negotiating with each other. Uh, I would be interested how the secret security architecture is evolving and how do you see Quad playing a role there? Thank you very much. Maybe I will uh, respond in, in uh, reverse to the questions, if you don't mind. First on the, otherwise I might forget my reply to your <laughs> The uh, first on the ASEAN, on the security architecture, especially with regard to the, uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific. Well, ASEAN, uh, I think two or three, three years ago, uh, uh, adopted the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. And uh, that was, uh, a, uh, a uh, negotiated text, and it fully reflects, I believe, the general uh, principles and approaches with which the ASEAN countries as a whole, ASEAN as a whole, views the Indo-Pacific. And essentially, the, the, main, um, the main principles are, are that the Indo-Pacific should remain uh, open, inclusive, not aimed at any particular country or groups of countries. In other words, open to all. And uh, basic uh, principles would be it would subscribe to good governance, uh, rule of law, uh, free and open trade, and, and cooperation in general. And we believe that uh, these are the uh, principles which would guide cooperation in the region and also uh, uh, make it the basis for an Indo-Pacific uh, regional uh, cooperation, even Indo-Pacific region. Uh, so that's where uh, ASEAN stands on that, and it's quite, and in fact, it's a very clear document which states our position. Uh, now, I mentioned the, um, on, in terms of the COC, uh, just to clarify, in the general principles, ASEAN is fairly uh, united on that. It's when we get to the nitty gritty, as you know, in the negotiations where countries uh, uh, tend to have, I wouldn't say differences, but sometimes nuances in the position. And that's why uh, it's taking time, I believe, to, to uh, negotiate that. Uh, and of course, I, maybe I can just say, if I one um, issue that will have to be addressed at some point in the future by all the countries, and this will involve each individual country, is whether the code should be legally binding or uh, not. Uh, we're not yet there. Uh, but that will certainly be one of the issues. And I think there, you would have to say that uh, each country probably would have uh, to think about it first. But on the general principles, ASEAN is uh, definitely united in terms of how we approach the negotiations and what general issues or, uh, we are trying to address with China. But uh, again, let me say, China and the ASEAN countries, at least at the political level, are all committed to, to finalizing the code, uh, and in our case, to ensure that it is an uh, effective and substantive uh, code of conduct. Uh, on the issue of the, uh, uh, of the Ukraine, well, we, the President, uh, Marcos Jr., has always said that uh, uh, the uh, conflict in the Ukraine has had, uh, is now, can no longer be viewed as limited to just the, that area. It has had effects uh, on, uh, in fact, almost every country, in the case of the Philippines, in terms of uh, uh, food security and uh, agriculture. And uh, this uh, has necessitated our uh, trying to forge greater partnerships with other countries in, in uh, promoting and, in, and achieving uh, food security arrangements and agriculture. And it's also made us try to address other areas such as uh, renewable energy, et cetera. So uh, we feel that uh, this conflict has uh, certainly um, transcended and, and affected all countries in the world, which is why, of course, we are supporting all efforts to promote a peaceful resolution of the, of the conflict in the Ukraine. Uh, on, on cybersecurity, I mentioned uh, this is certainly an area which we hope to, to explore more fully uh, with all partners, especially with India, given their uh, well-known um, uh, lead in this area. 
and we want to really uh, see in the Philippines how we can do this. In fact, uh, most recently now, I mean, just today, I, uh, of course, the fact that we are deeply interconnected is, is there, but uh, for example, we need to address issues such as uh, uh, even false news, uh, fake news, uh, which has just come out re the other day, affecting even my department. So, uh, I mean, these are, these are issues which we need to address. I mean, they're so obviously false, but they do create a big following. And uh, I think in terms of cybersecurity, we would like very much to discuss areas where uh, we can address cyber terrorism. And even more recently, trafficking through cyber terrorism. We have, uh, that seems to be a new and emerging threat that a number of our citizens, not only the Philippines, but countries in our region, ASEAN countries, are being, uh, people are being affected by scams. And uh, we have uh, uh, had to address this by trying to rescue many of our nationals from this. So I think uh, these, this is a very new area, not new, but certainly an emerging area where we need to have cooperation, especially with countries such as India. I think we can work together for this. So actually there's quite a, a long list. And again, as I said, this is an area that we will discuss uh, in our talks and even after our talks, but certainly we are quite open to exploring these areas such as cyber terrorism uh, and uh, cyber trafficking. These are the negatives we have to address uh, with India especially. Thank you so much, Secretary Manalo. I do know that you have another appointment and uh, you have kindly agreed to join us for a cup of tea. But thank you so much for taking the many questions from the floor. And I think your answers have probably led uh, many other hands to go up, but then <laughs> there's always a time limit. And thank you so much for your time. Manalo and for being with us here today at ICW. On behalf of ICWA, I would like to take this opportunity to once again thank His Excellency Enrique Imanalo for graciously accepting our request of delivering the 42nd Sapru House Lecture on such an important topic. We have benefited immensely from your remarks and gained valuable insights. I also thank our audience this morning for their valuable participation in this event and enriching it with their meaningful observation and questions. May I now invite everyone for high tea in the foyer. Thank you all and have a good day. <laughs>